This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Michael Scherer. Typee by Herman Melville. Chapter 11 Various and conflicting were the thoughts which oppressed me during the silent hours that followed the events related in the preceding chapter. Toby, wearied with the fatigues of the day, slumbered heavily by my side, but the pain under which I was suffering effectually prevented my sleeping, and I remained distressingly alive to all the fearful circumstances of our present situation. Was it possible that after all our vicissitudes we were really in the terrible valley of Taipee, and at the mercy of its inmates, a fierce and unrelenting tribe of savages? Taipee or Hapar. I shuddered when I reflected that there was no longer any room for doubt, and that, beyond all hope of escape, we were now placed in those very circumstances from the bare thought of which I had recoiled with such abhorrence but a few days before. What might not be our fearful destiny? To be sure, as yet we had been treated with no violence, nay, had been even kindly and hospitably entertained. But what dependence could be placed upon the fickle passions which sway the bosom of a savage? His inconstancy and treachery are proverbial. Might it not be that beneath these fair appearances the islanders covered some perfidious design, and that their friendly reception of us might only precede some horrible catastrophe? How strongly did these forebodings spring up in my mind, as I lay restlessly upon a couch of mats, surrounded by the dimly revealed forms of those whom I so greatly dreaded. From the excitement of these fearful thoughts, I sank towards morning into an uneasy slumber, and on awaking with a start, in the midst of an appalling dream, looked up into the eager countenances of a number of the natives, who were bending over me. It was broad day, and the house was nearly filled with young females, fancifully decorated with flowers, who gazed upon me as I rose, with faces in which childish delight and curiosity were vividly portrayed. After waking Toby, they seated themselves round us on the mats, and gave full play to that prying inquisitiveness which time out of mind has been attributed to the adorable sex. As these unsophisticated young creatures were attended by no jealous duennas, their proceedings were altogether informal, and void of artificial restraint. Long and minute was the investigation with which they honored us, and so uproarious their mirth that I felt infinitely sheepish, and Toby was immeasurably outraged at their familiarity. These lively young ladies were at the same time wonderfully polite and humane, fanning aside the insects that occasionally lighted on our brows, presenting us with food, and compassionately regarding me in the midst of my afflictions. But in spite of all their blandishments, my feelings of propriety were exceedingly shocked, for I could not but consider them as having overstepped the due limits of female decorum. Having diverted themselves to their heart's content, our young visitants now withdrew, and gave place to successive troops of the other sex, who continued flocking towards the house until near noon by which time I have no doubt that the greater part of the inhabitants of the valley had bathed themselves in the light of our benignant countenances. At last, when their numbers began to diminish, a superb-looking warrior stooped the towering plumes of his headdress beneath the low portal, and entered the house. I saw at once that he was some distinguished personage, the natives regarding him with the utmost deference, and making room for him as he approached. His aspect was imposing. The splendid, long, drooping tail-feathers of the tropical bird, thickly interspersed with the gaudy plumage of the cock, were disposed in an immense upright semicircle upon his head, their lower extremities being fixed in a crescent of guinea beads which spanned the forehead. Around his neck were several enormous necklaces of boar's tusks, polished like ivory, and disposed in such a manner as that the longest and largest were upon his capacious chest. 
Thrust forward through the large apertures in his ears were two small and finely shaped sperm whale teeth, presenting their cavities in front, stuffed with freshly plucked leaves, and curiously wrought at the other end into strange little images and devices. These barbaric trinkets, garnished in this manner at their open extremities, and tapering and curving round to a point behind the ear, resembled not a little a pair of cornucopias. The loins of the warrior were girt about with heavy folds of a dark-colored tapa, hanging before and behind in clusters of braided tassels, while anklets and bracelets of curling human hair completed his unique costume. In his right hand he grasped a beautifully carved paddle spear, nearly fifteen feet in length, made of the bright core wood, one end sharply pointed, and the other flattened like an oar blade. Hanging obliquely from his girdle by a loop of sinate was a richly decorated pipe, the slender reed forming its stem was colored with a red pigment, and round it, as well as the idol bowl, fluttered little streamers of the thinnest tapa. But that which was most remarkable in the appearance of the splendid islander was the elaborated tattooing displayed on every noble limb. All imaginable lines and curves and figures were delineated over his whole body, and in their grotesque variety and infinite profusion, I could only compare them to the crowded groupings of quaint patterns we sometimes see in costly pieces of lacework. The most simple and remarkable of all these ornaments was that which decorated the countenance of the chief. Two broad stripes of tattooing, diverging from the center of his shaven crown, obliquely crossed both eyes, staining the lids, to a little below either ear, where they united with another stripe which swept in a straight line along the lips and formed the base of the triangle. The warrior, from the excellence of his physical proportions, might certainly have been regarded as one of nature's noblemen, and the lines drawn upon his face may possibly have denoted his exalted rank. This warlike personage, upon entering the house, seated himself at some distance from the spot where Toby and myself reposed, while the rest of the savages looked alternately from us to him, as if in expectation of something they were disappointed in not perceiving. Regarding the chief attentively, I thought his lineaments appeared familiar to me. As soon as his full face was turned upon me, and I again beheld its extraordinary embellishment, and met the strange gaze to which I had been subjected the preceding night, I immediately, in spite of the alteration in his appearance, recognized the noble Mahavi. On addressing him, he advanced at once in the most cordial manner, and, greeting me warmly, seemed to enjoy not a little the effect his barbaric costume had produced upon me. I forthwith determined to secure, if possible, the good will of this individual, as I easily perceived he was a man of great authority in his tribe and one who might exert a powerful influence upon our subsequent fate. In the endeavor I was not repulsed, for nothing could surpass the friendliness he manifested towards both my companion and myself. He extended his sturdy limbs by our side, and endeavored to make us comprehend the full extent of the kindly feelings by which he was actuated. The almost insuperable difficulty in communicating to one another our ideas affected the chief with no little mortification. He evinced a great desire to be enlightened with regard to the customs and peculiarities of the far-off country we had left behind us, and to which, under the name of Manika, he frequently alluded. But that which more than any other subject engaged his attention was the late proceedings of the Frani, as he called the French, in the neighboring bay of Nukahiva. This seemed a never-ending theme with him and one concerning which he was never weary of interrogating us. All the information we succeeded in imparting to him on this subject was little more than that we had seen six men of war lying in the hostile bay at the time we had left it. When he received this intelligence, Mahavi, by the aid of his fingers, went through a long numerical calculation, as if estimating the number of Frenchmen the squadron might contain. It was just after employing his faculties in this way, that he happened to notice the swelling in my limb. He immediately examined it with the utmost attention, and after doing so dispatched a boy who happened to be standing by with some message. 
after the lapse of a few moments, the stripling re-entered the house with an aged islander, who might have been taken for old Hippocrates himself. His head was as bald as the polished surface of a coconut shell, which article it precisely resembled in smoothness and color, while a long silvery beard swept almost to his girdle of bark. Encircling his temples was a bandeau of the twisted leaves of the omu tree, pressed closely over the brows to shield his feeble vision from the glare of the sun. His tottering steps were supported by a long, slim staff, resembling the wand with which a theatrical magician appears on the stage, and in one hand he carried a freshly plated fan of the green leaflets of the coconut tree. A flowing robe of tapa, knotted over the shoulder, hung loosely round his stooping form, and heightened the venerableness of his aspect. Mahavi, saluting this old gentleman, motioned him to a seat between us, and then uncovering my limb desired him to examine it. The leech gazed intently from me to Toby, and then proceeded to business. After diligently observing the ailing member, he commenced manipulating it, and on the supposition probably that the complaint had deprived the leg of all sensation, began to pinch and hammer it in such a manner that I absolutely roared with the pain. Thinking that I was as capable of making an application of thumps and pinches to the part as anyone else, I endeavored to resist this species of medical treatment. But it was not so easy a matter to get out of the clutches of the old wizard. He fastened on the unfortunate limb as if it were something for which he had been long seeking, and muttering some kind of incantation continued his discipline, pounding it after a fashion that set me well-nigh crazy, while Mahavi, upon the same principle which prompts an affectionate mother to hold a struggling child in a dentist's chair, restrained me in his powerful grasp, and actually encouraged the wretch in this infliction of torture. Almost frantic with rage and pain, I yelled like a bedlamite, while Toby, throwing himself into all the attitudes of a posture-master, vainly endeavored to expostulate with the natives by signs and gestures. To have looked at my companion, as sympathizing with my sufferings he strove to put an end to them, one would have thought that he was the deaf and dumb alphabet incarnated. Whether my tormentor yielded to Toby's entreaties or paused from sheer exhaustion, I do not know. But all at once he ceased his operations, and at the same time, the chief relinquishing his hold upon me, I fell back, faint and breathless, with the agony I had endured. My unfortunate limb was now left much in the same condition as a rump steak after undergoing the castigating process which precedes cooking. My physician, having recovered from the fatigues of his exertions, as if anxious to make amends for the pain to which he had subjected me, now took some herbs out of a little wallet that was suspended from his waist, and moistening them in water, applied them to the inflamed part, stooping over it at the same time, and either whispering a spell, or having a little confidential chat with some imaginary demon located in the calf of my leg. My limb was now swathed in leafy bandages, and grateful to Providence for the cessation of hostilities, I was suffered to rest. Mahavi shortly after rose to depart, but before he went, he spoke authoritatively to one of the natives whom he addressed as Cory Cory, and from the little I could understand of what took place, pointed him out to me as a man whose peculiar business thenceforth would be to attend upon my person. I am not certain that I comprehended as much as this at the time, but the subsequent conduct of my trusty body servant fully assured me that such must have been the case. I could not but be amused at the manner in which the chief addressed me upon this occasion, talking to me for at least fifteen or twenty minutes as calmly as if I could understand every word that he said. I remarked this peculiarity very often afterwards in many other of the islanders. Mahavi having now departed, and the family physician having likewise made his exit, we were left about sunset with the ten or twelve natives, who by this time I had ascertained composed the household of which Toby and I were members. As the dwelling to which we had been first introduced was the place of my permanent abode while I remained in the valley, and as I was necessarily placed upon the most intimate footing with its occupants, I may as well here enter into a little description of it and its inhabitants. This description will apply also to nearly all the other dwelling places in the vale 
and will furnish some idea of the generality of the natives. Near one side of the valley, and about midway up the ascent of a rather abrupt rise of ground, waving with the richest verdure, a number of large stones were laid in successive courses, to the height of nearly eight feet, and disposed in such a manner that their level surface corresponded in shape with the habitation which was perched upon it. A narrow space, however, was reserved in front of the dwelling, upon the summit of this pile of stones, called by the natives a pipi, which being enclosed by a little picket of canes, gave it somewhat the appearance of a veranda. The frame of the house was constructed of large bamboos planted uprightly, and secured together at intervals by transverse stalks of the light wood of the hibiscus, lashed with thongs of bark. The rear of the tenement, built up with successive ranges of coconut boughs bound one upon another, with their leaflets cunningly woven together, inclined a little from the vertical, and extended from the extreme edge of the PP to about twenty feet from its surface, whence the shelving roof, thatched with the long tapering leaves of the palmetto, sloped steeply off to within about five feet of the floor, leaving the eaves drooping with tassel-like appendages over the front of the habitation. This was constructed of light and elegant canes, in a kind of open screenwork, tastefully adorned with bindings of variegated sinate, which served to hold together its various parts. The sides of the house were similarly built, thus presenting three quarters for the circulation of the air, while the whole was impervious to the rain. In length, this picturesque building was perhaps twelve yards, while in breadth it could not have exceeded as many feet. So much for the exterior, which, with its wire-like, reed-twisted sides, not a little reminded me of an immense aviary. Stooping a little, you passed through a narrow aperture in its front, and facing you on entering, lay two long, perfectly straight and well-polished trunks of the coconut tree, extending the full length of the dwelling, one of them placed closely against the rear, and the other lying parallel with it some two yards distant, the interval between them being spread with a multitude of gaily worked mats, nearly all of a different pattern. This space formed the common couch and lounging place of the natives, answering the purpose of a divan in oriental countries. Here would they slumber through the hours of the night, and recline luxuriously during the greater part of the day. The remainder of the floor presented only the cool, shining surfaces of the large stones of which the PP was composed. From the ridge pole of the house hung suspended a number of large packages enveloped in coarse tapa, some of which contained festival dresses, and various other matters of the wardrobe held in high estimation. These were easily accessible by means of a line, which, passing over the ridge pole, had one end attached to a bundle, while with the other, which led to the side of the dwelling and was there secured, the package could be lowered or elevated at pleasure. Against the farther wall of the house were arranged in tasteful figures a variety of spears and javelins, and other implements of savage warfare. Outside of the habitation, and built upon the piazza-like area in its front, was a little shed, used as a sort of larder or pantry, and in which were stored various articles of domestic use and convenience. A few yards from the PP was a large shed built of coconut boughs, where the process of preparing the poe poe was carried on, and all culinary operations attended to. Thus much for the house and its appurtenances, and it will be readily acknowledged that a more commodious and appropriate dwelling for the climate and the people could not possibly be devised. It was cool, free to admit the air, scrupulously clean, and elevated above the dampness and impurities of the ground. But now to sketch the inmates, and here I claim for my tried servitor and faithful valet, Cory Cory, the precedence of a first description. As his character will be gradually unfolded in the course of my narrative, I shall for the present content myself with delineating his personal appearance. Cory Cory, though the most devoted and best-natured serving man in the world, was, alas, a hideous object to look upon. He was some twenty-five years of age, and about six feet in height, robust and well-made, 
and of the most extraordinary aspect. His head was carefully shaven, with the exception of two circular spots about the size of a dollar, near the top of the cranium, where the hair, permitted to grow of an amazing length, was twisted up in two prominent knots that gave him the appearance of being decorated with a pair of horns. His beard, plucked out by the roots from every other part of his face, was suffered to droop in hairy pendants, two of which garnished his upper lip, and an equal number hung from the extremity of his chin. Cory Cory, with a view of improving the handiwork of nature, and perhaps prompted by a desire to add to the engaging expression of his countenance, had seen fit to embellish his face with three broad longitudinal stripes of tattooing, which, like those country roads that go straight forward in defiance of all obstacles, crossed his nasal organ, descended into the hollow of his eyes, and even skirted the borders of his mouth. Each completely spanned his physiognomy, one extending in a line with his eyes, another crossing the face in the vicinity of the nose, and the third sweeping along his lips from ear to ear. His countenance, thus triply hooped, as it were, with tattooing, always reminded me of those unhappy wretches whom I have sometimes observed gazing out sentimentally from behind the grated bars of a prison window, whilst the entire body of my savage valet, covered all over with representations of birds and fishes, and a variety of most unaccountable-looking creatures, suggested to me the idea of a pictorial museum of natural history, or an illustrated copy of Goldsmith's Animated Nature. But it seems really heartless in me to write thus of the poor islander, when I owe perhaps to his unremitting attentions the very existence I now enjoy. Cory Cory, I mean thee no harm in what I say in regard to thy outward adornings, but they were a little curious to my unaccustomed sight, and therefore I dilate upon them. But to underrate or forget thy faithful services is something I could never be guilty of, even in the giddiest moment of my life. The father of my attached follower was a native of gigantic frame, and had once possessed prodigious physical powers. But the lofty form was now yielding to the inroads of time, though the hand of disease seemed never to have been laid upon the aged warrior. Marheyo, for such was his name, appeared to have retired from all active participation in the affairs of the valley, seldom or never accompanying the natives in their various expeditions, and employing the greater part of his time in throwing up a little shed just outside the house, upon which he was engaged to my certain knowledge for four months, without appearing to make any sensible advance. I suppose the old gentleman was in his dotage, for he manifested in various ways the characteristics which mark this particular stage of life. I remember in particular his having a choice pair of ear ornaments, fabricated from the teeth of some sea monster. These he would alternately wear and take off at least fifty times in the course of the day, going and coming from his little hut on each occasion with all the tranquility imaginable. Sometimes, slipping them through the slits in his ears, he would seize his spear, which in length and slightness resembled a fishing pole, and go stalking beneath the shadows of the neighboring groves, as if about to give a hostile meeting to some cannibal knight. But he would soon return again, and hiding his weapon under the projecting eaves of the house, and rolling his clumsy trinkets carefully in a piece of tapa, would resume his more pacific operations as quietly as if he had never interrupted them. But despite his eccentricities, Marheyo was a most paternal and warm-hearted old fellow, and in this particular not a little resembled his son Cory Cory. The mother of the latter was the mistress of the family, and a notable housewife, and a most industrious old lady she was. If she did not understand the art of making jellies, jams, custards, tea-cakes, and such like trashy affairs, she was profoundly skilled in the mysteries of preparing amar, poi poi, and koku, with other substantial matters. She was a genuine busybody, bustling about the house like a country landlady at an unexpected arrival, forever giving the young girls tasks to perform, which the little hussies as often neglected poking into every corner and rummaging over bundles of old tapa, or making a prodigious clatter among the calabashes. 
Sometimes she might have been seen squatting upon her haunches in front of a huge wooden basin, and kneading poey poey with terrific vehemence, dashing the stone pestle about as if she would shiver the vessel into fragments. On other occasions, galloping about the valley in search of a particular kind of leaf, used in some of her recondite operations, and returning home, toiling and sweating, with a bundle under which most women would have sunk. To tell the truth, Cory Cory's mother was the only industrious person in all the valley of Typee, and she could not have employed herself more actively had she been left an exceedingly muscular and destitute widow, with an inordinate supply of young children, in the bleakest part of the civilized world. There was not the slightest necessity for the greater portion of the labor performed by the old lady, but she seemed to work from some irresistible impulse, her limbs continually swaying to and fro, as if there were some indefatigable engine concealed within her body which kept her in perpetual motion. Never suppose that she was a termagant or a shrew for all this. She had the kindliest heart in the world, and acted towards me in particular in a truly maternal manner, occasionally putting some little morsel of choice food into my hand, some outlandish kind of savage sweetmeat or pastry, like a doting mother petting a sickly urchin with tarts and sugar-plums. Warm indeed are my remembrances of the dear, good, affectionate old Tenor. Besides the individuals I have mentioned, there belonged to the household three young men, dissipated, good-for-nothing, roistering blades of savages, who were either employed in prosecuting love affairs with the maidens of the tribe, or grew boozy on arva and tobacco in the company of congenial spirits, the scapegraces of the valley. Among the permanent inmates of the house were likewise several lovely damsels, who instead of thrumming pianos and reading novels, like more enlightened young ladies, substituted for these employments the manufacture of a fine species of tapa, but for the greater portion of the time were skipping from house to house, gadding and gossiping with their acquaintances. From the rest of these, however, I must accept the beauteous nymph Fayaway, who was my particular favorite. Her free, pliant figure was the very perfection of female grace and beauty. Her complexion was a rich and mantling olive, and when watching the glow upon her cheeks I could almost swear that beneath the transparent medium there lurked the blushes of a faint vermilion. The face of this girl was a rounded oval, and each feature as perfectly formed as the heart or imagination of man could desire. Her full lips, when parted with a smile, disclosed teeth of a dazzling whiteness, and when her rosy mouth opened with a burst of merriment, they looked like the milk-white seeds of the arta, a fruit of the valley, which when cleft in twain shows them reposing in rows on either side, embedded in the red and juicy pulp. Her hair of the deepest brown, parted irregularly in the middle, flowed in natural ringlets over her shoulders, and whenever she chanced to stoop, fell over and hid from view her lovely bosom. Gazing into the depths of her strange blue eyes, when she was in a contemplative mood, they seemed most placid, yet unfathomable. But when illuminated by some lively emotion, they beamed upon the beholder like stars. The hands of Fayaway were as soft and delicate as those of any countess, for an entire exemption from rude labor marks the girlhood and even prime of a typey woman's life. Her feet, though wholly exposed, were as diminutive and fairly shaped as those which peep from beneath the skirts of a lima lady's dress. The skin of this young creature, from continual ablutions and the use of mollifying ointments, was inconceivably smooth and soft. I may succeed, perhaps, in particularizing some of the individual features of Fayaway's beauty, but that general loveliness of appearance which they all contributed to produce, I will not attempt to describe. The easy, unstudied graces of a child of nature like this, breathing from infancy an atmosphere of perpetual summer, and nurtured by the simple fruits of the earth, enjoying a perfect freedom from care and anxiety, and removed effectually from all injurious tendencies, strike the eye in a manner which cannot be portrayed. 
This picture is no fancy sketch. It is drawn from the most vivid recollections of the person delineated. Were I asked if the beauteous form of Fayaway was altogether free from the hideous blemish of tattooing, I should be constrained to answer that it was not. But the practitioners of this barbarous art, so remorseless in their inflictions upon the brawny limbs of the warriors of the tribe, seem to be conscious that it needs not the resources of their profession to augment the charms of the maidens of the vale. The females are very little embellished in this way, and Fayaway, with all the other young girls of her age, were even less so than those of their sex more advanced in years. The reason of this peculiarity will be alluded to hereafter. All the tattooing that the nymph in question exhibited upon her person may be easily described. Three minute dots, no bigger than pinheads, decorated either lip, and at a little distance were not at all discernible. Just upon the fall of the shoulder were drawn two parallel lines, half an inch apart, and perhaps three inches in length, the interval being filled with delicately executed figures. These narrow bands of tattooing thus placed always reminded me of those stripes of gold lace worn by officers in undress, and which are in lieu of epaulets to denote their rank. Thus much was Fayaway tattooed, the audacious hand which had gone so far in its desecrating work stopping short, apparently wanting the heart to proceed. But I have omitted to describe the dress worn by this nymph of the valley. Fayaway, I must avow the fact, for the most part clung to the primitive and summer garb of Eden. But how becoming the costume! It showed her fine figure to the best possible advantage, and nothing could have been better adapted to her peculiar style of beauty. On ordinary occasions she was habited precisely as I have described the two youthful savages whom we had met on first entering the valley. At other times, when rambling among the groves, or visiting at the houses of her acquaintances, she wore a tunic of white tapa, reaching from her waist to a little below the knees, and when exposed for any length of time to the sun, she invariably protected herself from its rays by a floating mantle of the same material, loosely gathered about the person. Her gala dress will be described hereafter. As the beauties of our own land delight in bedecking themselves with fanciful articles of jewelry, suspending them from their ears, hanging them about their necks, and clasping them around their wrists, so Fayaway and her companions were in the habit of ornamenting themselves with similar appendages. Flora was their jeweler. Sometimes they wore necklaces of small carnation flowers, strung like rubies upon a fiber of tapa, or displayed in their ears a single white bud, the stem thrust backward through the aperture, and showing in front the delicate petals folded together in a beautiful sphere, and looking like a drop of the purest pearl. Chaplets, too, resembling in their arrangement the strawberry coronal worn by an English peeress, and composed of intertwined leaves and blossoms, often crowned their temples, and bracelets and anklets of the same tasteful pattern were frequently to be seen. Indeed, the maidens of the island were passionately fond of flowers, and never wearied of decorating their persons with them, a lovely trait in their character, and one that ere long will be more fully alluded to. Though in my eyes at least, Fayaway was indisputably the loveliest female I saw in Taipei, yet the description I have given of her will in some measure apply to nearly all the youthful portion of her sex in the valley. Judge ye then, reader, what beautiful creatures they must have been.